Excellent. What's up guys, welcome back to Paul's Hardware. This is Probing Paul, my monthly Q&A series that I usually do towards the end of every month. This is episode number seven, and this is for August of 2016. It is getting late in the summer, and I've been traveling this month, but I could not neglect Probing Paul. So uh, let's start off with a look back through the sands of time. Look how tiny Kyle's little picture is getting down there. It's very, so small. Anyway, those are all the previous probing polls. Uh, but let's get started with the first question. This one comes from Prince, and this was posted on last month's video. So if you guys want to ask me questions for this month, post them in this month's video's comments section. Question to ask, can you turn a closed loop water cooler into an open water cooler or a custom loop? you might say. I have a closed water cooler and I was wondering if it's possible to use a pump and water block for an open water cooler, kind of tight on money right now. I'd like to use as much as I can for uh, my closed system on a new open system. The answer is yes, you can in some situations, but it can vary. Now I have a couple uh, actual choices or things that I've done here in the past. Uh, right, let's start off with what I think you probably have, which is something like one of these right here. This is a Thermaltake Water 2.0. This is a basic Ace Tech OEMs closed loop cooler. Comes with the pump block combo here, and these sort of standardized uh, types of, of closed loop cooling connectors. These are fixed, and they're not really meant to be removed. Yes, they can be removed. Yes, they can be reused. I've seen it done, but it's very difficult, and you're going to be dealing with uh, questions about the seals going on there, and it's just not the best idea. These are kind of closed, and they're meant to stay closed. That's not to say that you don't have options for this, though, if you, if you want to do it. So here is the radiator, it's still kind of dusty, from a Swiftec uh, H220, H220X, whichever this one was. This one has barb fittings on the end, and this one is made to be expandable. What happened here was the pump failed, causing me no small amount of heartache, and then I basically removed the tubing via the tool clamp fittings there on the end, and I was able to have this radiator, which I now use to, like, say, look, a 240 millimeter radiator fits, so that kind of thing. Or it's a copper radiator, which is still very nice, and just the pump not working doesn't mean the radiator has anything wrong with it. Also, you'll notice it has a fill port on there, and that is kind of important for topping things off. Uh, continuing along, though, I have some suggestions for you if you really want to buy something new. I, I'm assuming you already have one, but Fractal, for instance, has expandable loops. So this is their Kelvin coolers. Difficult to get in the U.S., but elsewhere it's a little bit more uh, easy to find. These have G1 quarter fittings on the end, so that basically um, makes it a lot easier to replace these adapters if you need to. Uh, another one that has standardized G1 quarter fittings is the Alpha Cool Iceberg. It used to be uh, made and sold through Cooler Master, but now I think it's just an uh, Alpha Cool product. Um, again, you can remove the fittings and replace them if you want to, or they're just a little bit easier to um, swap out because they're that G1 quarter standard. EK also makes the XLC Predator. This one's cool because it actually has a quick disconnect in the middle, so you can use that quick disconnect to like disconnect easily and then loop in another part, of, part to the system, assuming you get other quick disconnects that are compatible, and that is a great option as well. Um, I actually just built this system behind me, this uh, test bed, and I used the fractal cooler and I was able to, I didn't expand it, but I had to remove the fittings from it and sort of to, to feed them through. And definitely having replaceable, removable fittings was very helpful for that. Anyway, thank you for the question. Next question though, from Sean Rudes. Will you make an all AMD PC sometime? This is a good question, a timely question, considering that I just also posted a video uh, with a first look at AMD Zen. Uh, this was actually from last week at that's supposed to be muted. Uh, it's from last week. They had some new announcements about Zen. They had some architecture details. They're actually coming pretty strong with this. They also had a side-by-side -side comparison of a Zen versus a 6900K, um, which should be taken with a grain of salt, but looked promising. All that is to say that, yes, I'm very excited about making an all-AMD system, especially now that we got the new Radeon RX cards. RX 480, I think, is a very good card. I won't build one now, though, because AM4 isn't launched. That's really what I'm waiting for. Socket AM4 is going to be the new socket for both AMD APUs as well as AMD CPUs. APUs have integrated graphics, CPUs do not. And um, the Bristol Ridge chip that, we're, that they're talking about here should be an 8-core, 16-thread socket AM4 uh, CPU without an integrated GPU as far as we know. And uh, it, it should be a really cool option. So something like that combined with like a new Vega uh, GPU that we're also hopefully going to see by the end of this year would be a really exciting build to do. All that said, um, I don't see myself doing one anytime soon until I can get my hands on an AM4 motherboard. Um, for more on that, let's go to the next question. Look, I, I tied these two together somehow. Uh, Jose Vasquez says, wait, 
So current AMD CPUs and APUs will work with the new AM4 motherboards? Uh, a very good question, and I think there's going to be some confusion here, but I will explain the, to the best of my knowledge what I know so far. All right, so current AMD CPUs and APUs, current generation that slot into socket AM3 motherboards, AM3 Plus motherboards, or FN2 Plus motherboards, two different types of sockets, all use the same CPU microarchitecture. It's all based on the original bulldozer chip, bulldozer microarchitecture that uh, they started, I think, in 2010 or 2011 when the 8150 launched. Everything since then has been different iterations, refinements to that same CPU microarchitecture. It's still 32 nanometer, I believe, but even the most recent chips are based on Excavator. Those are just refinements of what's going on. So what we're going to see when AM4 launches is an initial offering of motherboards, or so we're told, so we're expecting, that are AM4 and that will slot in current generation APUs, not on the, not with the same socket though, so you will need a new APU. You're not going to be able to buy an APU right now that's FM2 Plus and then slot it into a, an, AM, an AM4 motherboard. So when AM4 launches, what you will have is current CPU microarchitecture based APUs, at least that's what we're expecting, based on probably excavator cores with some, you know, maybe a Polaris uh, GPU in there or something like that. That would be cool. But those will not be using Zen. And then maybe at the same time or maybe later on down the road, we will see Zen CPUs, maybe even APUs with Zen cores in them as well. New microarchitecture, new AM4 socket, but you'll still have apparently other AM4 based. Uh, previous generation microarchitecture APUs also available. I hope that makes some sense. But what I think, going back to the previous question I will plan on doing, is when AM4 launches with an APU, current gen, I'll do a new update on uh, maybe, a, maybe a budget build on that or something a little bit more, more reasonably priced with like an FX uh, uh, RX 480. And then further down the line, when Zen actually launches, hopefully by the end of this year, and we have Zen like hopefully really good performing CPUs, something like that with a Vega uh, GPU, I'll totally do. And as long as everything you know launches as we're expecting, then, then yeah, you should be seeing that for me as well. All right, let's try to rip through some more of these questions. Minihas asks, in the future ultra-wide benchmark videos, could you upload them in 21 by nine aspect ratio? Yes, maybe, I've had different thoughts on that. I think what I might do is 4K with the 21 by nine sort of embedded in 4K. I might upload native at 21 by nine, but it, it really cuts down on the number of people who are who could watch those videos. I know people who already have a 21 by nine monitor. Um, it's really cool to watch that format, but I'm what I'm trying to do is get people into that format. So if you have a 16 by nine and you have to watch it 21 by nine, it's just, you can't see quite as much. So yes, I will take that into account and perha perhaps just how I do things in the future. What I really need to do is start doing everything in 4K. Anyway, Frequency asks, would you use liquid metal as thermal paste for GPU and or CPU? Yes, totally would. Uh, liquid metal thermal paste is often touted as some of the best options that are out there. Often works a little bit uh, better than synthetic stuff. You do have to worry about conductivity, so um, using too much and splooging over the sides is a little bit more of a concern in that aspect. I also don't I don't usually, I'm not usually nitpicky about thermal paste simply because usually from the best thermal paste you can get to like the sort of mediocre crappy stuff is a difference of two, three, maybe four or five degrees Celsius, which isn't a huge difference. And I don't often go like the min max route of trying to get the best of the best of the best possibly of everything and go for maximum overclocks. So for that reason, I'm not as picky about the thermal paste, but that's no reason not to use it. Just remember it's conductive. Uh, Moron Soldier asks, hey Paul, what's that keyboard you've got there? I mean the one you're using in the video and the one in the background. Uh, I have a few here. So this is a Corsair K95, old school, red switches. This is actually the keyboard that I used in my how to clean a keyboard video, which is one of the more popular videos I've done. Um, and it still works. Although I'm moving around all my questions right now. There's only like one key that's still a little sticky. The zero. Anyway. Uh, that's just one of them though. There's also the, this one. This is the Master Keys Pro L from Cooler Master. RGB and all that good stuff. That's a nice one. Uh, and then my floater keyboard is this one right here, which is starting to get a little bit dusty and dirty, uh, which is a quick fire rapid eye, also from Cooler Master. And I just like it because it's small. So if I set up a system, I can just plug it in. Or sometimes I use this down below me on the floor to control the teleprompter with my toe. 
but I'm not doing that today. All right, uh, Yota Ninja asks, Hey, Paul, for the next episode, can you answer this? What is a good introductory camera and setup to get? Uh, I would like to make tech videos like mine or Linus's or Jay's or any of the large tech tubers. Um, all right, so if you're just starting out, it's difficult for me to say you should invest, you know, a thousand dollars in a camera or something like that, which is was originally what I was going to say. Get a GH4. GH4 is really nice, but actually what I would suggest is to start out with something like a cell phone because cell phone cameras, uh, as long as it can do like 1080 video, anything that's come out in the past two, three years can be pretty decent. Granted, some of them have much better optics than others, but it's a quick way to get yourself off the ground. They have good storage. Some can even do 4K. And, you know, you can just point it at stuff and start making your videos before you take the next step of investing in a camera. That said, if you are thinking about investing in a camera, I will tell you some of the actual features that I look for. And of course, I'm using my GH4 to show you. All right, so one thing I really think you should consider if you are doing YouTube videos, and especially if you're filming yourself, is a flip out screen. That way, when you're filming yourself, you can see what you're filming and you don't have to like go back behind it or use a wire wireless thing or something like that. Uh, having a audio input is gonna be very important. The more you do video, the more you realize audio is often overlooked and having a good audio solution can really improve uh, your quality. Uh, you can record separately, but being able to just plug it in and record straight to the camera is very important. I also really like having an HDMI out, uh, a clean HDMI out that you can use live. That's what I'm using right now to capture all this right now with my other GH4. And those are just things I would keep my eye out for. Next from Justin Murray, what's the wrist rest you're using? And have you tried or uh, ergonomic mice? And I could do a head to toe ergonomic setup uh, video or something like that. Uh, I haven't really considered the full ergonomic video or anything, uh, but this, if you're wondering, is, what is this? It's handstands. Handstands? Yeah, I got this on Amazon based on reviews. Uh, I really like it so far, it's made in China. But it's got micro beads in there and I got it because people were like, oh, you can like, make a little hole and remove some of the micro beads if it's like, you know, if it's got too much support. But mainly I like having my wrist straight when I'm using the mouse. You know, you gotta try to keep this plane straight and as long as I do that, I typically don't get too much fatigue or anything. Also, you know, generally good practices like keeping the back straight and the feet flat on the floor and all that good stuff is important as well. Um, but yeah, I like this wrist rest and uh, I'll post the Amazon link to it down in the description if you guys wanna check it out. Couple more questions. Din Van Nguyen says, between a 6900K and 5960X, which will you choose? They're both a core, they both have similar performance. They are both similarly priced, if I am not mistaken. Here's a 6900K, thousand, well, 1100 bucks right now on Newegg. Here is the 5960X, well, 1016. So it's about 80 to $85 cheaper. I would still say just go with the 6900K. Because you're already spending a thousand dollars, relatively speaking, eighty bucks more. It's really not that big of a difference. Broadwell E is going to be faster on an instructions per clock level. Granted, you potentially might have better overclocking with the 5960X, but that really is going to vary on a chip by chip basis. And honestly, if I was just buying one of these straight up right now, I just, I just sack up and go for the 6900K because uh, it's, you know, it's it's a little bit better. It's, it's a little bit better. And why would you buy, why would you spend a thousand dollars on a processor and not get the best processor you could? Because you don't want to spend seventeen hundred dollars on a sixty nine fifty X. That would probably be a good answer to that question. Uh, Jax Macintosh says the thumbscrew logo on your shirt. Is there any meaning behind it, or is it just a thumbscrew? Uh, I don't. I'm not wearing the shirt right now, but I have it on my fancy mug right here. My thumbscrew logo, I really like. I wanted something that was simple and hopefully slightly iconic and that represented PC building to some degree without being like a graphics card or something. Um, I guess if there's a backstory, it would go back to my one of my earlier power supplies and one of my first, one of my earlier uh, custom built systems was a PC power and cooling. And I forget why, I don't think I had to have the power supply replaced. I forget why, but I had to get in touch with PC power and cooling and they were just really nice and really good service. They've been bought and sold since then, but I, I still like PC power and cooling. Uh, but they sent me a little a little envelope with like four thumb screws. It was the first thumb screws I had had with a PC. I was just like, this is so much better. They were like brass, you know, I think I might still have them around somewhere. Anyway, that's that's as much of a backstory as I can come up with for my thumb screw logo. Maybe 2.1 gigahertz. Oh, oh God. See? You see what happens? You've upset the dogs. I was I only I only sketched out for half a second that, that Hero was gonna knock my, my camera over. 
finally, uh, this is my P.O. box if you guys want to send me stuff. 4325, Diamond Bar, California. And uh, I, I promise I'll check it soon, and then we usually do mail time on the live show, so I, that's when we actually open those things. Anyway guys, thank you for watching this video. I hope you've enjoyed it. Hit the thumbs up button. Uh, leave me more questions in the comments section down below if you want me to answer your questions next month. Also check out my store. You can buy shirts, mugs, pint glasses, all that good stuff. Links are in the description. And as always, thank you for watching.